Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. I spent the morning uh, a little bit of time in the workshop on uh, tools and workflows. So it was a pleasure to see that. Those of you that were there, you saw how technical it is. This here will be a little higher level. But at the end of the day, with these uh, workflows that we are building in eBrains, everything that I will talk about, you can reproduce using the tools in workflow. Of course, I will present it a little in a smoother fashion, et cetera. There are so, so many issues, yeah. but in principle, it is possible. And that is one of the purposes of my uh, presentation here. And uh, I was asked to talk about clinical translation. We are working on uh, clinical translation in different uh, uh, on different levels in different diseases. I will focus on epilepsy because it is uh, one of the most advanced one where we actually are able to use literally the entire chain of uh, tools to go from the patient through the data to the model all the way back to the uh, patient. And uh, that's why it's actually uh, exciting. And what you see here, the uh, as an ambition statement, build personalized high resolution brain models to better understand the brain. And as a scientist, we'd like to understand brain function and for clinical apl applications. In other words, we'd like to make the knowledge that we are generating useful. And that means we have to um oriented around clinical questions clinical challenges that people that are working directly with the patient have that's actually non-trivial yeah? because you may get, generate beautiful insights into mechanisms that may be actually exciting but not very useful in order to help directly in the clinics and uh, this cleft to bridge it um is uh, a challenge we call it innovation translation and uh, there are certain principles that need to be followed and i'll show you a little bit uh, how uh, we are doing it and uh, the challenges in particular in clinical translation that we are running into i captured some of them here number one the brain is multi-scale that's wonderful because it, the multi-scale nature of the brain um, enables neurodegeneracy. Degeneracy uh, is another word uh, for the fact that multiple mechanisms can cause the same behavior. Every multi-scale system has this property, not just the brain. But uh, what it means is essentially that uh, through different, uh, if you wish, parameterizations, you can generate the same type of uh, brain activity and the same time of brain, fun uh, uh, brain function. That is great uh, because uh, in case of injury, the brain can adapt. It can reconfigure itself plastically uh, and uh, then uh, recapture, rehabilitate uh, the brain function that was lost. It is bad from the scientist's perspective because that generates issues of non-identifiability. You are analyzing and characterizing a certain type of behavior. So what is the underlying generating mechanisms when you have many options? that can give rise to the same behavior. So it's a many-to-one mapping and one-to-many. That's a challenge. This, I'm citing here a friend of mine, Yves Reniak, who has actually has, uh, written that neurodegeneracy is a key obstacle to progress in neurosciences, yeah? because we actually want to understand. And then other challenges we run into in clinical translation is intersubject variability, uh, which is also highly linked to the neurodegeneracy and uh, the validation. Yeah. I will uh, spend quite some time on this uh, aspect when I, I want to translate our results back to the patient. To be very concrete, I will jump a little from the abstract level to demonstrate that we can apply this to multiple brain diseases and uh, it's a, a way of translation, but then I want to be also very concrete all the way to a single patient. I will finish with a use case of a single patient. So epilepsy, drug-resistant epilepsy. 1% um, of the po human population will have an epileptic seizure once in his or her lifetime. 
Yeah? This is a lot. 60% of these patients we can treat uh, pharmaceutically, yeah? which means 40 patients we cannot treat with medication. And for those, uh, we have to find other means. Uh, a hot topic in development is stimulation. Um, but there we don't really know what's happening. <laughs> another hot topic, uh, not, not hot topic, another custom approach to uh, help the patient is uh, surgery. There is a concept of an epileptogenic zone uh, in which actually the seizure, a seizure is a, a paroxysmal oscillation. These are typically high frequency discharges that are highly synchronized and then start recruiting other brain regions incapacitating uh, the patient. Uh, this we call the epileptogenic zone. And, uh, the epileptogenic zone is a target for uh, a resective surgery. So we want to remove it, hoping that the patient is not impacted too much uh, with uh, regard to the remaining functional behavior, and hoping also that the patient will be um, uh, re relieved from uh, the, the disease. And I'm formulating it a little carefully because uh, um, there are sometimes consequences that are uh, difficult to handle with regard to this. Yeah? So having said this, uh, in order to know where the epileptogenic zone is, we uh, need to have more information. So we are exploring the patient's brain activity through so-called stereotactic EEG, which means we enter into the brain. We introduce so-called Talarac needles that goes back to Jean Bonco and uh, Talarac. These are electrodes about that length that have multiple millimeter spacing, and you are recording the activity directly in the brain. And here you see the individual contacts that are located on this electrode, the discharges, pre activity, seizure onset, and this paroxysmal activity that I was talking about. Surgeon, based on this, you need to make a decision where the epileptogenic zone is, and then it will be removed by the surgeon. When you look back at the success rate of the surgery over the past 50 years, I'm plotting only a couple of decades, but it goes back for the past 50 years, it has stagnated, saturated, at around 60%, depending on the type of epilepsy. And so, or said differently, in about half a century, the surgery success rate has not improved beyond 50, 60%. So we need solutions for this, and we hope that with digital neuroscience, we can provide solutions. What is the idea behind that? And that's a concept. And please look at this as an epilepsy as an example that we can actually generalize to other diseases. What is the key concept behind that? In epilepsy, based on the symptoms, you have to make a decision where to put electrodes. That's already invasive. Think about it. You drill a hole, you insert a, uh, uh, an electrode, highly in invasive. But there are no other options. Yeah? So you enter and you uh, um, record uh, inside of the brain. And you do this measuring this type of signals. Yeah? And based on the interpretation of these signals, yeah, then a decision is being made what is part of the epileptogenic zone and what becomes the target of surgery. This is how we are operating. What we are doing, can you hear me, by the way, with it? because I'm moving, it's okay with it? Yeah, okay. Uh, what we are doing, we are building a digital twin of this brain that goes beyond this area. Yeah? Digital twin is a mathematical formulation of our knowledge. Yeah. All the knowledge that we have assembled over the past centuries about brain function, we formulate it mathematically as much as we can uh, in terms of equations. So as we implement mathematically, we, which means we are going actually beyond the visible area of the SEG electrodes and expanding to the rest of the brain, neurochemistry, neuroelectricity, other brain areas, with the hope that if we measure here, and there are other areas also implicated that we are actually capturing these contributions also. Yeah? Or said differently, by combining um, SEG data, physiological data, with our knowledge, the mathematical model, 
We can develop processes, let's call them inference, causal inference. We can develop uh, processes in which we are balancing the value of the data, the value of the model, in order to be able to make better statements than uh, we were, uh, we would have, we would be able to do only in the presence of the data. So we are talking about data augmentation in this sense. This is the spirit, and this can be generalized way beyond epilepsy. But I want you to have understood that because here, in this case, I can visually present it. Yeah? And you will see this picture again towards the end of the presentation with real data and demonstrating you that we actually can do this. Yeah? So um, another way to look at this is the following, and here I'm connecting actually to the workflows of eBrains. We are having here the elementary causes, the mechanisms, our formulation of the mechanisms in the real world uh, brain. And um, they are generating brain activity, brain function that we are accessing via observable data measurements. This could be EEG, fMRI. Based on this, typically we do not deal only with uh, experimental with the raw data, we deal with data features. So there is already an uh, underlying theory behind that. It could be functional connectivity. We spoke about analysis today uh, in the uh, workflow tools workshop. Um, and um, functional connectivity would be one of those. Based on this, what you want to do actually is you want to infer the underlying elementary causes, understanding the mechanisms. Huh? This is an uh, inversion. And for this, what we are actually doing is we are building a loop, a causal inference loop. Uh, the causes, we formulate them mechanistically, the digital twin, to a level where the model is capable of generating uh, this type of uh, raw data and corresponding metrics. And from this, and typically this is what we measure in the empirical brain, Having such a uh, uh, brain model, we want to infer and go back and infer what are the elementary causes. Typically, that means we want to extract parameters because our model, on the one hand side, empirical data on the other hand, the link between these two are the parameters. So we are performing not just an optimization, but an estimation of all possible parameter values. Why do we have to do this? neurodegeneracy. There is not one single mechanistic cause in a multi-scale system, but many multiple ones. Keep this in mind. So we need to have a more sophisticated approach that requires tools such as uh, machine learning, uh, Monte Carlo uh, uh, approaches yeah, that are actually sampling the possibility of all possible uh, mechanistic realizations. Very important, think of the patient, you will perform surgery on the patient. Yeah? So you want to know where you're standing. So on the one hand side, this is abstract. On the other hand, uh, there is a real world challenge behind that that we are dealing with. And this loop that I just showed you is fully supported by what we're doing in eBrains. On the one hand side, we have Atlas services. The knowledge graph allows us to represent the data and uh, allows us to parse the data, link it to the model, and uh, ha have it uh, curated and represented in the same brain reference space, mapped parameters upon data features. Yeah? And then uh, we are able to formulate and parameterize these models, run simulations, making use of the backends that we have available, and uh, going uh, back through our validation purpose, uh, uh, our validation processes that we have in order to make statements. So these are the workflows that we have that are behind that. Very specifically, what we're going to do for epilepsy is the following. Yeah, so now I'm uh, becoming a little more concrete for epilepsy. Yeah? We are scanning an individual patient's brain. Yeah. Uh, in the MRI, typically we do this with MRI, we obtain on the one hand side diffusion images, which allows us to reconstruct the connectivity, the white matter fibers. Anatomy, this provides us with the topography, the geometry in three-dimensional physical space. In the, we are uh, putting the data, representing the data in the same reference space. This gives us a structural connectivity. Uh, because we have a physics representation, we have physics simulators, we can actually map 
the sensors, the needles in this particular case, using the CT of the individual patient and map them upon the sources. So the electromagnetic physics simulators are relevant. We collect everything in the same reference space using the physics. So these are the sources, the same sources that we have modeled here. We map them in to the, the same reference space in which the models are already represented. And that allows us now to use some inference procedures. So balancing of models and data in order to generate this type of maps that we are providing to the epileptologist and the surgeon. And you see there are actually multimodal distributions, estimations. Sometimes we simply do not know. Um, you're a physicist, aren't you? What is the square root of four, please? No, it's plus minus two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're not able to give me an unambiguous answer. This is the same problem we are running in here. So the bimodal distribution would be plus and minus two over these. Very, very narrow. Yeah, That's what we're encountering here. Yeah? So we are working... This is how we are building the models. We are working in the applications with clinics. We are working with mostly with this type of representation, what we call a low resolution virtual brain. There we have about 200 nodes, 164 in our clinical applications that are represented here. We call it low resolution because when you do the brain map, each node represents a brain area about, in average, 16.4 square centimeters. This is huge, actually, when you think about that. Yeah, and uh, But it works for certain applications. In the uh, source to sensor mapping, we're making many errors. We're just as, uh, assuming the distance, etc. So we have quite some challenges there. Another approach that we are uh, taking is we are developing high-resolution virtual brains. Yeah? And uh, where we are fusing the data at a much higher resolution here, uh, by a factor 1,000 uh, bigger. So there we are in the millimeter range. This is much more difficult to use in everyday life in clinical routine, but it's possible. Yeah? And there, uh, this is where eBrains is becoming uh, relevant. Yeah? We can perform a model inversion so estimating an um, epileptogenic zone at these high resolutions in 24 hours using running it on a supercomputer. On the workstation where we are doing at the moment our clinical uh, uh, patients, yeah, there it would take two months. Yeah? So this is, uh, but we, uh, that's the reason why we're doing it in low resolution at the moment to test it because that's closer to applications in the real world later because we want to generate societal impact. So we, the, the, there are balances that need to be taken. I will speak today from the science perspective a little more on the high resolution efforts that we are uh, dealing with here. So low resolution and high resolution virtual brains. Um, <clears throat> you saw what you see here is roughly... Uh, what it looks like in the low resolution representation, one color is one network node, but here you see the individual vertices. This is a difference, yeah? so millimeter. And that gives much better representations in terms of source to sensor mapping. These, uh, eight, we are already at personalized brains here because we're using individual diffusion data to constrain uh, this brain, individual connectivity. I'm not entering into this, but there is a large literature today, which has been generated over the past 10 years, verified, confirmed in animal experiments and verified in patients that actually individual connectivity has a predictive factor despite inter-individual variability and can actually improve the individual prediction. And you will see later what individual prediction means. Obviously, in the case of the patient is uh, epilepsy, it's the identification of uh, the epileptogenic zone. We need to equip this model now with uh, mathematics that is capturing the brain activity. Um, for this, we need to traverse scales from uh, the individual neuron, which is generating the electric activity that we are able to measure, to populations of neurons, yeah, which is uh, generating the activity that we are able to measure in clinical recordings. There we are on a very macroscopic level. And that's the reason why the virtual brain is actually the major engine to, for clinical translation in eBrains, because 
uh, there we are generating the type of data that can be actually clinically measured. Yeah? So we are using means, so one means of linking the scale is uh, the following. We can build uh, mean field models of neuronal population. What is, it, what is a mean field? A mean field is an approach from statistics where we're actually averaging, we are, we're building so-called momenta. Some of you that are familiar with statistical physics, these are cumulants, essentially. We can perform cumulant uh, decompositions where we can write down the, uh, the dynamic equations for the mean value, for the variation, for the third moment, fourth moment, etc. It's a way of uh, building collective variables that are representative on the uh, statistically mean level. It's like in uh, thermal statistics, temperature does not exist on the microscopic level because there it's oscillation, uh, rotation, movement of the molecules. But on the collective level, temperature is definitely a very useful quantity. Yeah, same thing here. Yeah, so we are applying, we're separating excitatory and inhibitory neurons into two populations, uh, performing mean field theory. There are multiple approaches depending on which approximations are being made. Then we have low dimensional representations of it, inhibitory, excitatory, and then we can build what we call a neural mass based on these uh, reduced equations. And uh, this is an example. Alain Destex is a colleague of us uh, working in HPP and eBrains. Uh, who has contributed over the past decade a lot to that. Excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons. This, uh, this is a raster plot with individual spikes plotted over seconds. And um, uh, you can actually now average the activity and you get mean firing rates, excitatory, inhibitory. And here you compare it to the reduced mean field equations. Here you have multiple ten thousands of degrees of freedom here you have two three four degrees of freedom so it's an enormous uh, dimension reduction the, so and, uh, the big advantage of this is those equations we can actually study mathematically we can operationalize them and uh, perform parameter sweeps even on our, our laptops yeah and then identify the different brain states in which the mean fields operate slow oscillations sleep stages epileptic stages, et cetera. So we are using this type of model. This is one way of linking the scales. Okay. And uh, that provides us then with uh, equations of this type. There is a dot on top uh, of this psi. I apologize. Yeah. Psi dot, this is the activity. This is a, a activity vector. Intrinsic dynamics, local dynamics, so uh, nearest neighbor connectivity when we have the higher resolution brains. This is a sigmoidal separation function. This is a white matter connectivity for the large scale connections and the time delay via propagation. This is the mathematics that we end up with. Another way of traversing scales is something that was also discussed this morning is actually linking the different simulators that you have encountered. The virtual brain on the one hand side and a high resolution, sorry, a microscopic, high dimensional version of a, a particular region of interest. In epilepsy, very often we deal with the hippocampus, yeah? highly excitable region. 50% uh, of all the epilepsies we have uh, involving the temporal lobes and uh, also the, uh, the hippocampus. So there we can go in detail and have a single neuron uh, representation thereof, but there we need to use a different uh, a simulator, nest. So these two have to be able to communicate with each other. This one operates in terms of firing rates. This one uh, operates in terms of uh, individual spikes. Timing issues, they need uh, uh, to be uh, synchronized. Uh, the different uh, variables need to be converted into the language that the other uh, simulator understands. Yeah? So this exists in uh, eBrains. Uh, there are multiple co-simulation technologies that are in development. This is an example that comes here from uh, uh, the activities that we have in human brain project as a proof of concept. Yeah, so uh, Michele is involved there, Egidio, Javier. Here you see data coming from Javier's lab here in uh, Madrid, anatomical data. We're talking about the hippocampus, uh, electron microscopy in which actually the positions of all the 14,000 for the million cells that have been recorded, being represented as you uh, see it here. Each cell is being extended to have a, a, a axonal and dendritic probability cloud of which then the 
um, uh, probability to make synaptic connections and to connect actually can be computed such that it is statistically uh, correct. And th uh, through this process, you can actually reconstruct the CA1 region of the human hippocampus. You then need to equip it with a corresponding electrophysiological response function, and that allows you actually to activate this now high dimensional region of interest. And it allows you to perform this type of uh, simulations. Yeah. So this comes from Michaela's lab, where you have the CA1 region in isolation. And for the same parameter setting, but embedded into the context of TBB, um, uh, you see that actually context matters. The activation is actually changing and is generating this type of propagating patterns that and, uh, Is it going or not? Yes, it is going. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that is actually uh, showing spatial temporal propagate, uh, uh, propagation patterns across the region of interest. This is proof of concept that we can do it. So far, there is no uh, scientific insight, yeah? but we are moving this forward. Yeah? So, um, how? What do the, how do we do this, building this uh, brain reference spaces uh, that has been mentioned now multiple times? Uh, there are multiple spaces that do exist in uh, this context. One is pro being provided by the big brain, the big brain histological space, which is the highest resolution space that we have available. In there, embedded, you, can have, uh, you have data coming from highly heterogeneous sources, different laboratories, uh, different origins. So you have to make sure that can actually be mapped reasonably correct into this reference space. For this, nonlinear spatial transformations have been developed, mapping between individual atlases yeah, that allow to make corrections for uh, the differences that are being provided by uh, the atlases. MNI space, for instance, is one of them that is then being mapped uh, over here. You see Roxana Koymans from Amsterdam working on one of the brains in which lots of effort has been invested that actually travels between Jülich, Paris, and Amsterdam, and is being scanned using different technologies, high field representations, uh, for instance, in MRI, or here in this example, polarized light imaging that gets us down to the micrometer level. Uh, here, this is what Roxana is doing. She's doing some uh, histoimmunological staining in order to capture the properties as the brain varies from one brain area to the other. We have lots of heterogeneity there. And this is being captured by these type of atlases and then represented in the knowledge graph and then mapped upon the parameters in the model. Yeah? A lot of it is in development, yeah? um, but and we are using sometimes so-called gap maps where we are simply interpolating the missing data. But that provides us with a framework in which we can actually operate today and estimating the missing data uh, through these interpolations. So going from millimeter all the way to micrometer, the micrometer that we're on the cellular level, and going from cells uh, to uh, fibers, receptors, connectivity, and also functional data. Yeah? And those in this, uh, in this reference space that can be navigated through the atlases. You have different representations. Here you have, for instance, the density, GABA receptor density, plotted across the cortical depths in the gray matter. Those can be mapped upon parameters directly in the TVB neural mass model that I showed you, which provides this type of parametrization specific for this one area. You have also other parameters in there in which you can actually characterize the variability because there is lots of variability and you have to know what variability we are dealing with. Yeah? So other example here for connectivity, this is a Chinoson brain that has been uh, developed by Cyril Poupon in Paris, scanned uh, uh, for very long time uh, uh, at very high, uh, uh, Tesla, very high field strengths. Um, providing us with a, a resolution of hundreds of micrometers. So there we have just a factor 10 away from the cellular resolution. Yeah. And uh, the gap map I already spoke about, so that we can reconstruct multi-scale connectivity for uh, this type of brain. This is ex vivo. I talked about personalized medicine. So what we need to do is actually ex vivo data 
fuse it with in vivo data and develop approaches to interoperate the two data, hoping that we get better productivity. And this works. We have done that. Uh, we're using a Bayesian approach for that. I will speak about this later on the next few slides a little more, but typically we use a high resolution framework and the individual data are the prior, so the initial condition, if you wish, yeah, that are then biasing the estimation in the high resolution framework that we have here. This is an example. So we are taking the high resolution frame. So here we are on the millimeter resolution. You see representation of the connectome, the connections I've sh uh, shown you, how they are intersecting actually the cortical surface, same thing for subcortical areas, of course. And then we end up with a structural connectivity matrix like this, yeah? Intrahemispheric fibers, yeah? One hemisphere, other hemisphere. Interhemispheric fibers, yeah? subcortical area and cerebellum. Yeah. And here using the Chenonceau ring, so the uh, high resolution connectivity on the scale of 200 micrometers. The big ring, the micrometer one, we cannot manage yet. Yeah, so reality check. Yeah, that's it is. Another way, uh, on the one hand side, that allows us now to build these high resolution brains. And uh, look, we are, uh, for better visualization, one thing, we are actually uh, inflating this, yeah, like a balloon, yeah, and then we are mapping in on a sphere. Of course, we make errors uh, through this. For visualization, it's useful. However, today we use also tricks to <laughs> accelerate uh, the uh, this type of representation to accelerate our neural field simulations, uh, the high resolution simulations, because here you can perform spherical mode decompositions and work in the spherical mode space, which allows us to use some of the tricks that are coming from quantum mechanics, actually, where many accelerations have been developed. Yeah, And then we can actually run the high resolutions even on our, the HPC uh, uh, systems. We don't have to go directly to the uh, uh, supercomputers. Re uh, representation of uh, the hippocampal folding as the CA1, CA regions are uh, in 3D represented and then being unfolded here. And actually, I'll show you an example here. This is a, a hippocampus. You see how it's mapped upon the sphere, embedded, because uh, the hippocampal area is actually part of the cortex. The cortex folds directly smoothly into this and then starts rolling up in uh, the uh, CA regions. And then on the surface, we can perform this type of simulations. So that's one example that allows us to, uh, on this level of description. Salut, Javier. Nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Allows us to um, compare it directly to data, but we need to make this a little more sophisticated than just visual inspection, obviously. However, get an impression of this. He said the data from Cathy Chabon's lab in the US. Uh, electrocortical gram, these are uh, 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 sensor points on the cortical surface, macro level. And here where the cross is, you have a microelectrode array, millimeter scale, where you see actually the propagation of this type of activities. And this exists only in the high resolution representation, propagation of activity. Why? Because in the low resolution, it's not defined. Remember the spatial resolution changes. Yeah? So. Um, to give you um, an example here, this is a rhinal cortex. Yeah? And um, the fibers that uh, leave the rhinal cortex connecting within the intra uh, uh, hemispherical regions and traversing on the other hemisphere. Yeah? You can actually take this high uh, resolution representation now quantified with your favorite graph theoretical connectivity measure yeah so here in this case it's uh, uh, connectivity strength and also go in there establish an epileptogenic zone because now we have a generative model the way we have built it in a high resolution rhinal cortex and simulation starts eventually yeah starts here please look at these areas did not propagate over, came through some fibers that were underneath, yeah, and only then it started propagating 
And what you saw in the experimental data, this uh, spiral wave we see very, very often in these ECOPs, yeah? Within the epileptogenic zone, a spiral wave organizes and you have these uh, propagating waves in there. This can be uh, understood and described only in the context of high resolution brains. And now for the first time we have the means of doing this. And uh, this is Paul Tripcon in my lab who did the simulation. What we are looking at are techniques now to intervene with that. In the heart, for instance, the heart is a big muscle. When you have arrhythmias in there, you're not just stimulating naively the entire heart. Yeah? You try to place it with uh, the stimulation and train it with uh, the arrhythmia in order to stop the arrhythmia, actually. But for this, you need to know this in space and in time how the, uh, the stimulation is happening. This is becoming now possible. Yeah? And these are some of the directions that we're investigating. So uh, at the moment, the level we are working with at clinically is this here. We once a brain has been personalized, and I will speak more about this now, uh, we fit the parameters and then we have a digital twin. Then we can run this type of uh, simulations. On blue, low resolution, but uh, virtual brain of the patient. In yellow, the uh, patient's electrodes. And then you run the simulation. Yeah, Preacle phase, onset. These are the electrodes. This is exactly what the clinician sees. Yeah. In red, I'm scaling up the energy that is in the individual electrodes. Yeah? You see this happening here. And we can actually mimic individual seizures. We can interfere. We can discuss different virtual surgeries, if you wish, or different strategies to explore it. What is best via stimulation, via surgery? But in, uh, in order to be able to do this, you need to have it patient-specific. The first element that is patient-specific is the connectivity and the topography, so the geometry in the brain space inside. Yeah. So uh, the second one is where is the epileptogenic zone? Yeah. This is another a type of personalization. For this, we need to infer. Remember what I talked about: causal uh, causation inference loop. So now we need to infer, despite the multi-scale nature of the brain. What is the mechanism and where it's located? Yeah? This is how we do it. A seizure, some preclinical activity, and then this is uh, called the seizure onset, fast discharges, typically low amplitude, and then uh, evolving. You see a frequency time plot of this seizure represented here, the spikes, back, 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 around 60 to 80 hertz ish, yeah? going down, slowing down developing a spike wave complex, which is represented here, and then path at the end seizure offset. The fact that you have here no activity is also classic. Yeah, one finds that very often. We're looking at the envelope function of, here you see three different seizures, which resembles essentially this one here. Yeah, three different seizures. And uh, the envelope function is essentially uh, what uh, we choose as a data feature, and we want to infer it because we have to do this across many different brain areas in order then given what the data are to judge the evidence that certain brain regions are located uh, uh, within the epileptogenic zone. So the question is, uh, how do we do this? Uh, mathematically, an object of this form, nothing, up, large, fast discharges, and the back down, stop, can be represented by a spiral. Yeah, so there was this is a field where we did a lot of nonlinear dynamics and mathematics, where essentially we have the resting state, rest. This is a pre uh stage. Then the fast discharges. This is this stage, and then after the seizure, the system goes back to this. We can actually parameterize this mathematically, or we can actually sample it using some so-called Monte Carlo techniques. Yeah, so this means you make many different uh, uh, suppositions of uh, 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 parameterizations, and then you test how well it fits. And here we are sampling essentially the projection down there in the two-dimensional space, and here the same thing for the spiral. Let me show you a few more realizations. So this is where the math is. On the one hand side, uh, I'm very proud of this paper. This is a math paper on bifurcation theory published in the leading journal of clinical neurophysiology. I, I read it. <laughs> it was seven 
highest cited paper for five years in a, a, in a journal of clinical neurophysiology. So this year is a math journal. This is not surprising. The geometry of epilepsy is the spiral. Yeah, this is an experimental representation thereof uh, uh, plotted in a delay space. Yeah. So, um, what does it mean? Sampling. We use ten minutes. Yeah, we use Bayes uh, theorem. Yeah, cool. Um, Bayes theorem. And uh, essentially, we need a dynamic system that we have represented here. And an in, uh, inference approach, we provide our uh, prior information as uh, a, a, a probability distribution here, represented in red. Yeah? And the likelihood is a representation of our causal mechanism, of our hypotheses that we can put into equations. Yeah? put in the context of uh, uh, data, so this provides us with another like uh, with a likelihood, put in the context of data, the context of a prior distribution by this equation, it's a little more complicated than this, but uh, I'm simplifying now, uh, the prior times the distribution that is generating from the causal hypothesis, we can actually obtain an uh, estimation of uh, our, a posterior probability estimation, which is our estimation of the parameters. That's what we can do. Yeah? And this we do by putting the model together with the data, and we can actually sample the hypothesized geometry of the epileptic seizure. Yeah? We, are, we do this by looking at the envelope function, so we're not going directly into the spiral, but we are going into the projected space. And here have some <laughs> experimental data. This is what it looks like. This year, resting state we are just down here this area brain area is here at rest look at the scales here this brain area is at rest the rest is here for this brain area node three but apparently this one undergoes a seizure so we are in the source space so we can actually expand this space in terms of dynamics and possible parameterizations and sample this these tools are available in eBrains today. Yeah? Uh, FRIT is one of them that was mentioned in the morning session. Yeah? Monte Carlo Markov chain methods, MCMC. What we are getting as an output is, this is epileptogenic zone overlaid to a post-surgical MRI. So this person was operated. These are the black areas here. For this area, this is the estimated excitability. In blue, this is what it looks like. This area where the center of mass is would be excitable. Sorry, epileptogenic. But there is also another maximum mode here. If you take a simplified approach, some of you maybe work with variational inference as, as it's popular in DCM, for instance, as, uh, for the experts. Yeah. So there you make a Gaussian approximation. This is what it looks like. This is essentially... Uh, there you're off. You're not getting the right information, but the clinician has to make a, a decision based on this multimodal distribution, a very important decision. And now if you take it into the context of other brain areas, this one here, brain area one, brain area two, you get this multimodal distribution. Yeah? Based on this, you need actually to make a decision now, is it likely to be um, a epileptogenic zone? Or is it not likely to be an epileptogenic zone? Not acting upon this information is also a decision. Acting upon this information is also a decision. This is the situation we are in. This is the best we can do. Yeah? And as we had it here, uh, we cannot do better often because, as we were informed, the square root of 4 is plus minus 2. We need additional information to know whether it's plus or minus. Yeah? But sometimes you can, can simply not do it. Let's apply this. Uh, here you have a situation overlaid. Uh, this is the patient I just showed you, where actually it, uh, the, uh, the, this went quite well. Yeah, the, uh, what co corresponded the prediction between the virtual epileptic patient and the surgery that was performed this is not the case here. Yeah, so we have actually retrospectively quite a number of situations, and uh, the, this is now the statistically of a group of fifty. Four patients, retrospectively, precision, uh, very close to specificity, 77%. So that's actually good compared against clinical hypothesis yeah, of uh, the prediction coming from VEP. It drops down in the case for not seizure-free patients. So there is something uh, 
uh, it is actually even more prominent for when you compare it not against clinical hypothesis, but against post-surgical MRI. So actually the surgery that was really uh, performed, patients that are seizure-free, this is uh, VEP, very high correspondence, which then drops down to 60% uh, in the case for not seizure-free. So there is a correlation. It's not causation. There is a correlation between performance on the one hand side and the actual outcome of the uh, surgery. Yeah? Um, and uh, that gets us actually to the situation that uh, uh, this figure I told you at the end of my talk, I will get back to this figure. This is a patient. Yeah? This is the epileptogenic zone that was estimated by the clinicians and from vp this is an area that can is actually here it's overlaid you can it's actually not accessible by the uh, seg when you look at what was done uh, for, uh, this is now for the uh, 25 patients where post-surgical mri is available the clinical hypothesis ei means epileptogenicity index was not able to uh, distinguish essentially uh, make a separation statistical separation between seizure free and not seizure free patients where this is actually when you take the digital twin thereof of each patient into account 29 percent of all estimated epileptogenic zones that came from the virtual brain were actually outside of the areas that were uh, outside of the areas accessible to the seg so that tells you something about the statistical fashion about the causal uh, uh, mechanistic uh, um, uh, predictive power thereof. Do I have one patient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have five minutes, I believe, something like three minutes. Yeah. Um, this is the patient that I just showed you. Uh, this is the patient's history. In the three T scanner, there was no lesion. We didn't see anything. In the seven T scanner. We were able to see something that could be a, uh, a, a, a discharging lesion, a dysplasia. Yeah. So uh, it was not entirely sure. And the lesion that may have been here, when you uh, actually explored the patient, you could see some of the uh, discharges in the area corresponding to this. Yeah. When you perform some more detailed analysis with high resolution EEG or combined with uh, MEG, the dysplasia is here. Estimates from the clinicians were in these areas. So that was, in this here, it was concordant. Here, it was more discordant. And then uh, through the preclinical exploration, you can collect spike rates in, uh, intracortically. You can estimate the epileptogenicity, which is essentially cross-correlation uh, 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 of the, between areas is what the clinicians use and co computer connectivity based on this actually we did also the virtual brain for this this is what was came from the connectivity range but we found also this additional area here left inferior frontal sulcus yeah? and uh, the patient was operated they chose only to uh, resect this area one month after the operation the seizures came back and she was actually identified to be angle class three, which is called uh, essentially surgery failure. Yeah? So we went back into the brain in order to explore this area in more detail. And with the MEG, in fact, we zoomed into these areas. And one year after surgery, we actually found in the area that came from the virtual brain, additional uh, spikes. So that actually were not visible before, but now we zoomed into this inside. And actually, the patient was operated again half a year ago since then she's seizure-free. Yeah? So this is exactly the patient I showed you earlier in the beginning. Yeah? One example out of many, many patients. In order to do this correctly, you need to run a clinical trial. This is what's happening now in France. Yeah? Clinical trial, 13 reference centers collecting 400 patients over four or five years that are data being centralized, sent to Marseille, virtualized, put in a clinical report, in the sense I showed you with the multimodal distributions that need to be interpreted, sent back to the clinical staff for decision-making. Yeah. And um, this is where we stand at the moment. We have almost 
80 patients, uh, when was that? Here in November last year. So I think we, we're going to be done with the clinical trial by summer next year. We have to wait for one more year because you have to wait until patients have to be seizure-free one year after the uh, surgery. So uh, this, despite COVID, you see COVID, how it, yeah, like everyone <laughs> in life. Yeah, so uh, we were able to go it. This is where we stand. Everything I sh showed you in terms of connectivity, model building, yeah, here is structural connectivity. Uh, Martin, this is dynamic functional connectivity, wherever you are. Yeah, so I spoke to a student earlier. So all this is running on a skeleton underneath in eBrains. Yeah, and what I showed you is one typical workflow, maybe a little sophisticated with a high resolution, yeah, uh, that is not yet in applications. Yeah. One thing I wish to emphasize is please have a look at this paper here where we are actually projecting for the future where this type of digital twinning may have applications in the future. Have a look at this paper. We're discussing it within HPP, trying to develop a roadmap. Isn't that a question of interest for the next uh, 10 years? And their digital twin plays a very important role. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I... I need to say this, Human Brain Project Summit, all of you are welcome to join us end of uh, March if you want to know more about this type of things, everything in eBrains. So I thank you very much for your attention. I thank my colleagues and friends here in the Human Brain Project and uh, also our funders. Thank you.